express. Um, we can still do that even when we're having a show. So feel free to go on and do that. And the YouTube is yeah. prepping now. So we just need one more couple seconds for that. And here Press. we go. Um, we can still do that. All right. So we are now live on YouTube. All right, and Dr. Smallwood, uh, you are welcome to go ahead and share your screen uh, while I'm introducing you and go ahead and get that ready. Uh, we are very happy today to welcome Dr. Arwen D. Smallwood, who is the Interim Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. He received his BA in political science in 1988 and MA in history in 1990 from North Carolina Central University. He received his PhD in early US and African American history from the Ohio State University in 1997. He has taught as a visiting lecturer at North Carolina A&T State University uh, 1993-94. He was director of African American Studies at Bradley University, 1994 through 2003. He taught in the Department of History at the University of Memphis, 2003 to 2013, and helped build its PhD program in African American History. He then became chair of the Department of History at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University 2013 to 2018, and latter chair of the newly organized Department of History and Political Science 2018 to 2022. So let's give a wonderful virtual welcome to Dr. Arwen Smallwood and Dr. Smallwood. The time is all yours. I'd just like to remind everyone to please mute yourselves. And also, it's just a, a kindness to also turn off your video while the speaker is speaking, uh, even though I will just highlight him. And we'll all come back uh, during the Q&A. We can all come back on screen at that time. So it's all yours, Dr. Dr. Smallwood. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that uh, warm introduction. Good to see people I know like Marvin uh, here as well. Uh, so I'll, you know, again, I'm looking forward to to walking through this. And it it appears that there there are folks who really are from that region and probably uh, share that heritage. Um, so this should be a, a good uh, presentation and talk for you. So I'll go ahead and jump straight in, um, and I'll start by saying that there are a couple of questions that I hope to answer. Now, I know most of you all are genealogists or you're particularly interested in, uh, in genealogy. And so I'm hoping that this, uh, you know, will answer some questions for you and kind of help direct your work as you kind of go through and, um, you know, this presentation and, and listen to this presentation. Uh, one of the questions that I hope that I can answer for you and that might be of interest to you is what we, you know, what have we overlooked about Black and Indigenous people uh, in North Carolina when studying the centuries before 1619? Uh, I know a lot of people have probably heard of the 1619 Project, those are from Virginia, but, you know, in North Carolina, we had an African presence uh, before 1619. Our earliest recorded African presence was in uh, 1586, and we'll talk about that during this presentation. So you have quite a few um, African uh, indigenous people, mixed people in Northeast North Carolina uh, earlier than 1619 when the indentured servants were brought to Jamestown, Virginia. So, you know, the answer again to that question is that there is a great deal that native peoples in North Carolina and Virginia uh, before contact with Europeans, um, the impact of the Spanish, you know, on them because the Spanish brought Africans to the Carolinas as well and to Virginia and then the impact of the English uh, later in the 1580s. And we're gonna talk about that during the presentation. Second uh, question I think uh, to be of some interest to folks is that as Europeans uh, settled in North Carolina and Virginia, how did blacks and indigenous people collaborate and build communities uh, both separately and together? And the answer is they merged everywhere, um, that we have settlements, um, plantations where you have indentured servants, both white, African, and Indian who intermarry and intermix 
And remember, these are indentured servants, not slaves. So they intermix while in being indentured, and then they become free people of color, mixed race people, free people of color. And they begin to populate, you know, on the frontier of the Virginia settlement uh, in Northeast North Carolina from Virginia and on the frontier in the Piedmont of Virginia. Uh, and then you have these frontier settlements, or, or should I, let's start the swamps first. Um, there were people who didn't want to be indentured servants who ran away, who escaped, and they fled into the swamps of Virginia and North Carolina, most notable being the Great Dismal Swamp, which is borders, which half is in Virginia, half is in North Carolina. And then in Southeast North Carolina, what we call the Alligator Swamp, uh, which pretty much all of Eastern North Carolina was swampy. They've drained the swamps now and they farm the land now, but during the time of first contact and when native peoples were living in the areas, they were mostly swamp. There are frontier settlements, you know, people who are of mixed heritage, they leave uh, the settlements, particularly as Virginia begins to legalize slavery and then begins to institutionalize race-based slavery that people of African descent you know, or who are mixed with African are gonna be slaves for the rest of their lives. You have large numbers of mixed race people who move to the frontier and live in independent communities on the frontier between the Native Americans and the Europeans. And they trade and serve as you know, go-betweens between the Indians and the white settlements. And then finally, the Native nations. Uh, Native peoples didn't really have any, uh, they didn't see race in the way that Europeans uh, began to see it. Even the Europeans initially didn't really see it, but then eventually create a race-based society. So on the frontier, Native culture was such that the children of their women, um, that's where you got your nation from. So if your mother was a Meharan, then you were a Meharan. If your mother was Choanoke, you were Choanoke. If your mother was Powhatan, then you were Powhatan. Uh, your mother was Tuscarora, you were Tuscarora. It didn't matter what the father was. Father could be black, could be Indian or white or another Indian nation. Um, you took your nation from your mother. And so on the frontier where slaves had run away to Indians, poor whites had run away to Indians, there were communities of Indians that included blacks, Indians, and whites, but they were living as Indian people because of the culture that they were involved with. The third question, how has slavery affected both communities? And really you can say all three communities, um, Indian communities, African communities, and white communities. Uh, and the answer is in many, many ways, you know, that uh, particularly in how slavery was established and legally expanded, uh, it led to the Native American slave trade and wars between Native American nations, you know, in which natives were enslaved. Uh, it led to the splitting of Native American nations into slave-holding Indians and non-slave-holding Indians. We'll talk a little about that. The Southeastern Indians, what we call the five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, Chickasaws, uh, the Yamases and Catawbas, not really considered five civilized, but were confederated with them, all practiced African Indian slavery and all moved uh, the five civilized when they moved to Oklahoma, forced marched thousands of African slaves to Oklahoma with them and used them, forced them to clear the land and cultivate cotton as they had done in the deep south and states like Georgia, Alabama, uh, parts of Tennessee and Mississippi. Uh, and then, you know, um, it would talk about the cause many African Americans to become mixed with Native American even out in Oklahoma today, um, because they had slavery until the end of the Civil War. In fact, they don't abolish slavery in Indian country in Oklahoma until 1870 after the US government forces them to abolish slavery. So you have a lot of people who are of mixed and uh, African Indian ancestry, even amongst slaveholding Indians, but certainly amongst the Indians in the Northeast who never practiced African slavery because so many ran away and they took them in and intermixed with them. And then the final question that I hope this presentation will answer and give insights on is uh, how has the European idea of race affected our communities? Uh, before the American Revolution, after and through to the Civil War, both Black and Indian people in North Carolina were described as mulatto or free people of color um, before the Civil War. Why and what does this mean? 
how have Black and Indigenous identities been seen as separate or the same? Um, example of this. Um, and I say at the bottom here, the answer is that most have always chosen one of four paths to survive. They have become Indian. Lumbees would be an example. And other groups that are still in North Carolina, Halawa Saponis, various types of Saponis, Maharans, they became Black. Um, quite a few African Americans, uh, the Shepherds, um, you know, for example, who founded North Carolina Central University, the founders of uh, North Carolina Mutual Life. There are many families that were Lumbee or would be considered Native people who went for African American and just considered themselves African Americans, but their brothers and sisters went for Lumbee, and the, their descendants are still considered Lumbee or considered Native today. Um, they became white. Very early on, whites were intermixing with Indians. They took Indian women, took them as their wives. They had a white wife back in the settlement. They had an Indian wife on the frontier because you couldn't trade with Indians unless you were considered family. And the only way you could become family was by marrying one of their women. So you already had people who were uh, having children that were half white and half Indian. And then if that half white, half Indian child married another white, very quickly, the child appeared to be all white, but they were actually of Indian ancestry. In some cases, they were triracial Indian and African ancestry, but they passed for white. And then the final category is what we call triracial isolates. And you have groups like the Melungeons, uh, the Jackson Whites, the Red Bones, the Brass Ankles. Uh, there are numerous groups of mixed race, triracial uh, people scattered from Indiana and Ohio, all through North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee and Kentucky, all through Vardy, Tennessee, down into South Carolina, into Louisiana and East Texas, uh, who were of mixed heritage, triracial heritage, Indian, Black and white. And they've chose not to be with whites, chose not to be with blacks or be seen as Indian, but created their own independent thriving communities in which they you know, were basically uh, people of color, free people of color, but triracial isolates. So we're gonna try to touch on these themes and through this presentation, hopefully it will give you some answers to the questions that and illustrate for you what I just laid out for you in brief um, as we kind of go through this presentation. So I'm going to start with Native Americans in North Carolina and Virginia um, at first contact. So the first part of this is going to be talking a little bit about Native American history and the impact of Native Americans on Virginia and North Carolina and how they are connected. Because historically, the regions are connected. They're connected today. They were connected 100 years ago. They were connected 300 years ago. They were connected uh, 500 years ago. Um, the native people were interconnected between Virginia and North Carolina. The Europeans that came were interconnected. They moved down from Jamestown into northeastern North Carolina. It was considered Virginia, North Carolina, eastern North Carolina was considered Virginia. And then uh, again, you know, when Africans are brought in, it's the same thing. So the region has always been connected and the peoples of the region, Indian, black, white peoples have always overlapped, intermixed and had uh, connections. But we're going to start with the native people. And we're going to talk about uh, the native folks in North America and what became the United States and you know what was significant about them prior to the arrival of Europeans. Now, I started with this illustration because when we get into European settlement and we get into colonization, um, the east, the areas east of the Mississippi River, which are called the northeastern and southeastern woodlands because of the, the forest that existed. Um, there are two major regions with two major uh, native groups and cultures, right? So you have your northeastern woodlands, and I just touch on a couple of the major groups here. We're going to get into detail about the North Carolina groups, but you know the dominant groups in the northeast, from you know the Mississippi River over up to the St. Lawrence River and up into Canada and the Hudson River. The dominant groups, what we call the Six Nations in particular, or uh, the Iroquois Confederacy are going to be the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, the Senecas, and the Tuscaroras. But then east of the Delaware, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, you're going to have your Delaware Indians and, of course, the Powhatan Confederation. It was a number of different Algonquin-speaking Indians that made up the Powhatan Confederation. 
And these are just your dominant group. Now, there are other groups in the in the, in the Midwest, in Illinois, the Illini, uh, you got your, um, your Peoria Indians, your Miami Indians in Ohio, but I'm only focusing on the Northeast Indians right now, which are gonna be uh, a significant part of, of first contact. Then when we get into the Southeastern Indians, and really it's the Cape Fear River, if you're looking at this map in the line, you know, it's the Cape Fear River. Everything north of the Cape Fear River is considered Northeastern Indians. So the Tuscaroras, along with the Indians of that region, uh, the Kaur, the Noosk, the Indians along, they're all considered to be Northeastern Indians. They all basically have a similar, you know, culture. They, they trade with one another. They align themselves together in military campaigns. They are all considered really kind of one people under one banner, if you will. Although they can be and there have been internal conflicts from time to time, they're all kind of united under one, you know, one banner. In the southeast, south of the Cape Fear River, uh, you have your Cherokees, the Creeks, the Catawba and the Yamasee, the Santee, and to the west, the Chickasaws and Choctaws out in Mississippi, um, parts of Alabama, and into Louisiana. So that's your basic construct. And I just mentioned at the top of the hour how um, Europeans, Africans coming together with Native people, we see a cultural divide even at first contact between what we call the Northeastern Indians and the Southeastern Indians in that the Southeastern Indians participate heavily in what we call the Native American slave trade. All of the Florida Indians were pretty much decimated by the Cherokees and the Creeks and sold off into slavery into the British Caribbean. And then the Northeastern Indians, you know, tended to be opposed to Indian slavery and African slavery, and they tended to harbor runaway slaves, intermarry and intermix with runaway slaves, and they really are the foundations of what we call the Underground Railroad, which smuggles uh, slaves from the Virginia and the Carolinas up through the Ohio Valley, Indiana, Michigan, across into Windsor, Canada, and on over and up into places like Montreal and into Toronto. So just an overview, a very broad overview of native culture and native people in the regions that we will have first contact during the time of um, first contact between Europeans and Africans. So to break it down a little further, all those nations of Indians, and it's just an overview because there are many, many more, but those Indians, they really broke up into three basic language groups. They broke up into the Iroquois, you know, dominating the Great Lakes region, as I mentioned, Mohawks, Oneidas, Cayugas, Onondagas, Senecas, um, and down into North Carolina with the Tuscaroras, the Meharans, and the Nottaways, and then to the west, the Cherokees. Cherokees are interesting. Cherokees were um, Iroquois, but they moved out of, uh, you know, down into Tennessee which was belonged to the Creeks who were Muskegon. And they took so many Muskegon women, so many Creek women that they remember women dominate the society. Women teach the children, you know, their traditions and who they are. They took so many Creek women when they invaded Tennessee and pushed the Creek out that they altered their culture. And the Cherokee began to see themselves as more Muskegon and Creek then they were Iroquois. Although all the evidence, anthropological and archeological evidence, and even their language indicates that they broke off and even their oral tradition, the Iroquois have an origin story, which we will touch on in a moment, um, in which the Cherokees were a part of them, but broke off. And they're the only group that did not remain in connection or contact with them. So you have these major language groups, again, the Iroquois, the Muskegans, and the Agonkawans, which tended to dominate the uh, Chesapeake Bay area of Virginia and the tidewater areas of Virginia coming down into the coastal areas of North Carolina. So when we look at and we talk about the Agonkawans, they're coming up from you know, the Chowan, Chowan River and in the swampy areas of eastern North Carolina up along the coast into the Chesapeake, the eastern shore of Virginia and Maryland, Delaware, on up you know, through New York State. But the Agonkawan peoples you know, who speak the Algonquin language, that's pretty much, that. they parallel the movement of the Iroquois coming down from Canada. They all, all of them originated kind of in New York and in the Northeast, and they kind of parallel each other's movement 
the uh, you know the Delawares and the Nanakokes uh, uh, that settle in uh, Virginia. They come down along the coast, and then you get into the Powhatans in Virginia, and then those other coastal Indians um, um, in eastern North Carolina. Um, so I will, as I wrap this part up, I will just you know state as a footnote. These groups were very familiar with each other. These groups shared, you know, um, you know, a history, uh, a great respect for each other. Delawares are still living amongst, you know, Six Nations at Grand River in Canada. Um, uh, uh, you know, Abenakis and other uh, Algonquin-speaking people are confederated with the Mohawks and the others at Montreal at, at Ganawagi, the Mohawk reservation there. So these Indians, you know, had a relationship that was uh, that was ancient. It goes back for hundreds of years. And they interacted with one another, traded with one another, sometimes had conflicts with one another, but in general, you know, were in uh, connect contact with each other as they moved down from Canada and from the St. Lawrence River Valley and the Hudson River Valley down into eastern North Carolina and Virginia. Okay. If we talk about the origins of the Iroquois who tend to dominate uh, Virginia and Eastern North Carolina, uh, particularly the Maharans, the Nottaways, and the Tuscarora. It's important to talk a little bit about that origin story, and I'll do it briefly and then try to move us along. But according to tr uh, oral traditions, and even the archaeological record backs this, uh, the Iroquois lived in the ancient city of Cahokia thou over a thousand years ago, many, many years ago. And they were one people. They were not divided into all the different Iroquois people who are, you know, are, are connected. And then there was a great natural disaster, a great flood that caused them to migrate. And they migrated from the Mississippi River Valley eastward. Now, the Cahokia, the city of Cahokia is still there. You can go to St. Louis. It's right near East St. Louis, across the river from St. Louis. I mean, the mounds are still there. They're, they're ancient mounds. They were designed just like the Aztec temples, you know, in Central America. The only difference is they were made out of earth instead of made out of uh, stones. In fact, you know, the old history and really the, we watched the movement of corn. Many of these people really originated in uh, the Arizona, Mexico area and really even further south. They originally came out of Central America and out of Mexico and then up from there up into the southwest and then over across the Mississippi River into the Illinois area. And then after this period of history, with the, they have this disaster, they disperse east and then separate into those different groups of Indians. And then, as I mentioned to you before, the Cherokees end up in Tennessee. And uh, so they end up settling in what became Tennessee, North Georgia, uh, you know, but uh, where the creek, you know, after um, forcing the creeks out of that particular region. I also point this out just as a footnote again, that. Um, all of these people are connected. They come from one common source, one common origin. That's been proven genetically as well. And again, we can see when they branch off from that one Iroquoian group. The Cherokees go off first, which is what the stories have always said. The Tuscaroras come off next. And then from the Tuscaroras, the, the Nottaways break off in Virginia and the Maharans break off in Virginia. Now, these groups are important. And I'll pause for a moment with the Maharans and Nottaways. Um, I'm sure many of you, because a number of you are from Virginia and are in the Virginia area, have heard of Nat Turner. So Nat Turner, his people are there basically in Cortland, Virginia, the Nottaways. Um, but I don't think many people realize he's a Nottaway Indian, or he was a Nottaway Indian. His great-great-granddaughter is chief of the Nottaway Nation of Virginia today. And they always have seen Nat Turner as an Indian, as Nottaway. Although he was mixed and he was African American as well, you know he is seen as native person. And as I pointed out to you, the Nottaways are Tuscaroras, as are the Maharans. They come off of one bloodline, and many many years one bloodline, and then they separate into what we know as the Nottaways of Virginia and the Maharans of uh, North Carolina and the Tuscaroras of North Carolina. Then you go over and you'll see the Cayugas. They come off next, and then crisscross the genetic lines and end up coming along next. Uh, two lesser groups I haven't talked much about, the Wynots and um, the um, Hurons, uh, which were in the Great Lakes region as well. But then we have the Senecas 
Of course, the Cayugas come back in and diverge into the Six Nations. We have the uh, Onondagas, the Susquehannas, the Oneidas, and then the Mohawks. And that is where we see our groups of nations. The five nations concentrated in the Great Lakes region with the Wynots and the Hurons along Lake Huron, all interact, interconnected and, and aligned with one another. And then the Tuscaroras broken off and in Virginia and split into the Maharans and the Nottaways in the Piedmont of Virginia and the coastal plains of Virginia, North Carolina. And then the Cherokees in the West, in the Appalachian Mountains, in North Georgia, North Alabama, Southern part of North Carolina, but throughout Tennessee. How they get into North Carolina um, and into the Virginia region, they come down uh, out of the Appalachian Valley and they follow basically the Roanoke River Valley southward and eastward. Um, Roanoke, Virginia is the source of the Roanoke River. Uh, from there, the river flows through Virginia and then eventually goes through Roanoke Rapids on down along my area, Indian Woods, which is in the southern part of Bertie County, and then out into the Albemarle Sound. Uh, the Meharan River flows through Virginia, down into the Chuan River, and then out into the Albemarle Sound, and then the Nottaway River and the Black River do the same. Okay, So as they migrate down along the Roanoke River, they will begin the process of settling um, beside, uh, on the banks of these major rivers. So they are, you know, connected. They are kinfolk, but as they separate from one another, they develop cultures that are distinct. And really, more so than anything else, the Europeans are the ones who really give them these distinct names, Nottaway, and they name the Nottaway River and the Maharan and the Maharan River. But I think culturally at that time, there was not a big difference between the Tuscaroras of North Carolina and the Maharans and the Nottaways of Virginia and Northeast North Carolina. We then come down further from the Roanoke River to the Tar River and the Noose River, which flow into Pamlico Sound. And the Tuscaroras just continue to populate along the rivers, moving south over land routes and settling along the banks of these major rivers, the sources of which are in the Piedmont of North Carolina. So we end up seeing the, um, the settling of the, um, of the, uh, Tar River, the Noose River, and then as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, they moved down as far south as the Cape Fear River, which as you see incorporates, you know, um, the Tar and Noose incorporate Raleigh and Wake County. Um, the Cape Fear, the source of it is up here in Greensboro and in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, and it all goes down into um, the Deep and Ha River and basically down to Wilmington, okay? So all of these peoples and all of these, these river systems, all of these areas are interconnected. And then between the Cape Fear River and the Yatkin River, you know, eventually you can talk about the Catawba River, then you get into the Southeastern Indians, you know, and you get into the Catawbas, the Yamases, you know, but those Indian groups that are to the South that were at odds with the Tuscaroras and their allies uh, to the North. So collectively, they are known as the Six Nations, uh, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, the Senecas, and the Tuscaroras. And since I see the Maharans and the Nottaways as being Tuscaroras, that constitutes what we call the Six Nations. Um, and they were the most powerful Indian confederation in the history of North America. All Indian nations were significant. But the Iroquois and the Iroquois Confederacy and the Indians that were militarily aligned with them and came under the protection of the Iroquois Confederacy made them the most powerful Indian nation in the history of North America. And they had a true democracy. Our foundations of the U.S. Constitution and our democracy are based upon the Iroquois great law and based on the fact that the Six Nations and the Indians they sheltered had this massive confederation in which people were equal. And not only were the people equal, it was the women who decided who the leaders were. The clan mothers collectively, they chose the chiefs and decided who the leaders were and what directions 
uh, the, the nation would go in. I think you see very clearly from this French map, you can see uh, Massachusetts Bay there in green to the east. You can see Long Island there in pink. You see New Jersey there in kind of an orange and on down to the Chesapeake Bay. You see the Eastern Shore, Maryland, Delaware, and then you see Virginia and Northeast North Carolina. And in the Western there in the peak in the Western part there, you see the Six Nations and you see their longhouses, their massive villages and their you know, communities. You can see them stretched there throughout the Western part of the state um, of what became the state of New York. And then if we go down into North Carolina, you have the upper Tuscaroras, the lower Tuscaroras. I've already talked about the Maharans and Nottaways, but I don't have them on this particular map. But then you have a number of coastal Indians who are Algonquin speaking people, uh, the Machapungas, the Bear River Indians, the Matamasquite, the Choanokes, the Yupin, Hatteras, Cor Noose, the Cora Noose, uh, Hatteras and Noose Indians and Cor Indians tended were Iroquois Indians. Uh, but the, the Roanoke, the Martuk, the Pamlico, the, Pos the Pasquatank, uh, et cetera. But you have all your Indian groups scattered throughout Eastern North Carolina, uh, most of whom, by the time we have large European settlements, are confederated. They may have been at odds with one another at different times in their history, but by the time we have significant um, English settlement, uh, they have become confederated uh, with one another by the time we get into the 1600s and 1700s to protect themselves against the uh, expansion of the English. Once again, because of this, when we think of the Iroquois, uh, we think of some of the most highly advanced native peoples in the history of the Western Hemisphere. When we think of the Iroquois, we think of the Incas in South America, we think of the Aztecs uh, in, um, in Mexico, uh, we think of uh, the Peblos and Alsazis, we think of the Pacific Coast. We think of a very highly advanced group of native people who had a tremendous impact on the development of America um, throughout the colonial period. And because of the Tuscarora's blood ties to the Five Nations or the Iroquois Confederation, um, they have a massive empire that stretches from the Great Lakes region of the, the Midwest and Northeast down into the South and into the Carolinas, okay? Uh, because of their trade networks uh, with their kinsmen to the north, uh, we are gonna see that, you know, they trade primarily seashells, but they have an extensive trade route throughout the Western part of North Carolina into Kentucky and down into South Carolina and North Georgia. Uh, and they're primarily trade, they'll trade salt, they trade paint, they trade all, all kinds of goods, uh, flint for arrowheads, but they're uh, known for trading, particularly to their kinsmen to the north, seashells. Um, and they trade uh, seashells that they gather from the outer banks of North Carolina uh, to their kinsmen uh, to the north. Um, and people say, well, seashells, what's significant about seashells? Why would they uh, trade seashells? Uh, just as a quick footnote, it's important to understand that seashells are seen as by native people as being the equivalent of gold and silver rubies, diamonds, precious stones. Uh, they valued seashells above all others, uh, other um, commodities. And they used seashells to make wampum belts. And those wampum belts were given you know, to people. They recorded their history in the wampum belts. And so wampum belts were extraordinarily important you know, to native cultures. And the Tuscaroras having control of North Carolina and access to the outer banks of North Carolina, they provided uh, most of the five nations with their seashells uh, to make wampum belt and to basically trade. Now, I'm not going to go into detail explaining about the clans because I've spent a lot of time on uh, Native people, but I wanted to touch on Native people because I know that, um, you know, many of you may or may not know that much about the Native peoples that were in Virginia, North Carolina, and their relationship with other groups uh, during this particular time period. So I didn't want to touch on it. But I will say very briefly here that when we talk about the Tuscaroras, that there were seven major clans, and the clans were took on the names of game animals that were abundant in the territories that they were settled on. And so we have seven major clans, and snipe, wolf, deer, turtle, beaver, bear, and eel. And there may have been other clans, but at the time of contact, when we had really good written records, there were seven, and so I represented those seven there. 
And the other nations that we're talking about, like the Powhatans and the Chilinokes and the um, Chesapeake Indians and the Nesmans, um, the Herons, they all had clans as well. And they had the basic same basic structure that we see um, the Tuscaroras having um, at the time of first contact as well. Uh, again, I'm not going to go over all these Indian nations, but this just written out and I've provided the, the, the PowerPoint presentation um, you know, to, to Ms. Sanders to share with you all uh, so that you can look at these uh, in detail on your own, but we won't go over, you know, I'm not going to go over all of these for the presentation. Many of these groups still exist, like the um, Saponis and so forth, they still exist in North America today. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk about European contact and talk about the Europeans. And um, we will, you know, move through and you all have to check me on my time because I know we I'm only supposed to be uh, given an hour, but I can have a tendency to go over uh, at that time. So just you check me and let me know when it's time for me to stop. But as I touch on the Spanish first, so we, now we're talking about Europeans. It's important to understand that the Spanish were here first, right? The Spanish got to the Americas 100 years before the English did. And they made contact with the native groups in North America. Um, there's we have a tendency to focus just on the English, and because that's where our history begins, is supposedly is with the English. So the years before the English got there, uh, we don't really touch on. But the Spanish were here, and they had explored uh, Florida, Texas. You can see, clearly see this is a map of the southeastern United States. They knew the the, the Cherokees, the Creeks the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, they knew the uh, Catawbas, the Yamasee, they uh, traded with them, you know, they released horses so that the Creek became horsemen uh, and had horses. So they had interacted with the folks and they had mapped the region, they knew where all the capital cities were and all of the major uh, players were, who the chiefs were. So they have a very good understanding of what we call the southeastern part of the United States and all of the native peoples that are there in the Southeast and they've interacted with them. Remember the Cape Fear River divides the Southeast from the Northeast and then between the Catawba and the Cape Fear River is kind of a no man's land because you know the Catawbas are enemies of the Tuscaroras and the Southeastern Indians tended to be in enemies of the Northeastern Indians and the Tuscaroras as well. But these regions were well known, well documented, well discovered and the Spanish were expansive. The Spanish had gone in and taken all the Caribbean. The Spanish had gone in and taken all of Central America and, and South America. They destroyed the uh, Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incas, and they'd taken all of the southern part of the United States, Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, all of Florida, all the way over to South Carolina. They were very expansive, and they had pretty much colonized and taken control of all of uh, North America particularly the coastal areas of North America within their first 100 years. But they found it very difficult to penetrate uh, north of the Cape Fear River. And it was because the Indians of the Northeast, including the Indians in North Carolina, the Tuscaroras, Maharans, Nottaways, were confederated and they had a democracy and they were all in alliance with one another. And unlike in Central America, where the Mayans had in, uh, had in Aztecs, had dominated, you know, native groups and enslaved native groups and really had, you know, abused them. The Spanish were able to get those Indians that were had been abused to turn against the Aztecs and help them to undermine and destroy the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Incas. And then once they destroyed them, then they enslaved the Indians that helped them to destroy them. But they could not do that to the Indians in the Northeast because the Indians of the Northeast, again, had a very different relationship. They were, I, I said, with the exception of the Southeastern Indians who were enemies, uh, those Indians north of the Cape Fear River had a, a relationship that was such that it was very difficult for the Spanish to try to penetrate their region. But that was not without effort. They did try. Uh, the Spanish move into North America. They established colonies all throughout Florida in both West Florida and East Florida and all throughout um, South Carolina at Paris Island and all the way up even into uh, North Carolina. They also go as far north as Virginia. Most people don't understand that before Jamestown, Virginia, in which the English settled Virginia, the Spanish were already there. The Spanish had built a mission there in Virginia at what became Jamestown. And they uh, established a church and they were attempting to Christianize the Indians and basically, you know, move into that region. And I have to do a quick 
brief history of this. The mission was established in 1570. Prior to 1570, the Spanish had gone along the coast of North Carolina and Virginia, capturing women and children and selling them off into slavery. In fact, there was a brisk Native American slave trade in the 1500s in which the um, Spanish took tens of thousands of Native American women in particular, but women, children, and sold them off into Europe as sex slaves. So there was a brisk trade throughout the Caribbean and along the coast of North America and throughout North America in which they captured Native American women in particular, and they took them back and sold them to the families in Spain and Portugal and throughout Southern Europe. Earlier, they had gone to the Chesapeake and taken, you know, the son of the chief of the Powhatans, took him down to Mexico City, educated him, taught him Catholicism and taught him the Spanish language, and then brought him back in 1870, 1871, to reinstall him as the chief of the Powhatans to gain a foothold in the Chesapeake and influence over those Indians. Um, it did not work out the way they hoped it would. Um, he had become so you know, Europeanized that he was different than his people. And in their traditions, their chiefs and their men could have multiple wives and oftentimes had multiple wives, but the Catholic church frowned on having more than one wife. And so the priest berated the young man in front of his people for having more than one wife. And he had to act because his people were very unhappy and incensed by it. And so he ordered the burning, the killing of the priest and the burning of the church and basically destroyed that outpost for the Spanish in the Chesapeake. When the Spanish became aware of what had happened, when they returned and found the church destroyed, the priest killed, they systematically went throughout the region burning and killing and destroying, you know, the homes of the Algonquin speaking people in the Chesapeake, forcing many of those people to flee those areas and go further inland and further south into North Carolina. So there is a whole bunch of activity that is happening in North Carolina, in the western part of North Carolina, where Pardo in 1566 goes up from South Carolina into the western part of Carolina, as far west as, um, you know, as, uh, uh, where Warren Wilson College is today, uh, establishing fortifications along the way, but really incensing the native people, creating alliances where you have Tutelos and Saponis who are actually suing people who break away from the Catawba people who are suing people and realign themselves with the Iroquois people. And then they burn and destroy all of those Spanish forts in the western part of the state and drive the Spanish out. And those alliances that were created between the Powhatans and the Siouan speaking people like the Tutelos and Saponis still exist today. There are Tutelos and Saponis still with the five nations, the six nations in Canada on their reservations, living with them even today. So there's this, this confusion that's happening and they're, they're attacking these drawings that you're gonna see here. Some are a bit disturbing, so I prepare you for that. But they were drawn by um, uh, the Spanish by Bartholomew, who was a priest who accompanied the conquistadors on their campaigns uh, throughout um, the New World, but particularly in um, uh, North Carolina. You've seen this style housing before. You've seen these palisades before. You've seen these long houses. They call them long houses, Iroquois long houses before. And you see the Spanish, you know, basically burning and destroying those long houses and abusing the peoples uh, in that region as they are attempting to seize control of these people and basically um, you know, destroy these people. They're releasing dogs on the people, they attack and burn the people's home, they kill the chiefs, um, they take their foodstuffs, burn their villages and their homes, um, but they uh, basically execute a campaign of terror in which they kill women and children uh, and men in an effort to destroy uh, these people and their alliances and gain a foothold in North Carolina and Virginia. This illustration is of the Spanish chopping the hands and feet off of uh, Indians. Um, in the American Philosophical Society, they have the greatest collection of Native American um, stories and, and, and archeological materials uh, anywhere in the country in Philadelphia. And uh, one of the stories, they have Tuscarora stories that were recorded as early as 1918 and in the 1930s, uh, audio recordings as well as written accounts. 
One of the stories of the Tuscarora was called the Handless Maiden. It's beautiful young Indian woman who did not have any hands. Her hands were gone. Uh, and when I read through that story, I thought that the story indicated that there was, um, you know, that this was just a story that was being told to children to, you know, make them behave and be right. And it wasn't until I found this illustration uh, in Bartholomew's work on their campaigns in Virginia and the Carolinas that I saw that this was actually a true story, that actually Native people's hands and feet were cut off while they were alive, and they had no hands and they had no feet. And it was all done, you know, to terrorize the Native people uh, and to bring them, you know, under the influence and the control of the Spanish. But what it instead it did was it incensed the Native people in Western North Carolina. It created new alliances between Tutelos and Saponis and other Indian groups, and they completely obliterated the Spanish in the Western part of the state, burning all of their fort and fortification and driving the Spanish out down into South Carolina and out into the sea. And the Spanish were never successful in gaining a proper foothold in North America, but the damage that they did to native people and how they affected the culture of the native people would remain and would be transformative. Not only did they spread disease all throughout Western North Carolina and throughout Southeast Virginia, in which ravaged whole villages and communities and devastated the native population, but they left a impression amongst native people about Europeans in uh, North Carolina, Virginia, that would not soon be forgotten. And um, it would remain with them until the arrival of the English in the region uh, in the 1580s. So I know I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna try to touch a little on the English. And as I said, call time on me, because if you don't call time, I may go long. So call time when we get to, you know, when I've, I've reached the end of my time. So I've already established for you the impact of the Spanish. I've already talked about, you know, how native people existed prior to the arrival of Europeans. I just touched on the first Europeans, which were the Spanish to arrive. I put, touched on the fact that they had impacts in North Carolina as well as Virginia. And I talked about the fact that they were already early on kidnapping Native American women and children from the Caribbean and from the coastal areas of North Carolina, Virginia, and right on up the North American coast. And they were taking them back to Europe and selling these uh, women in particular as sex slaves back in Europe. Um, at the same time, they were bringing Africans into the Caribbean from Africa, into the, into the uh, what was the Spanish Caribbean, Cuba, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and also even into parts of Florida. But I think one of the few things people uh, realize too, or don't really realize is that um, many of the early conquistadors, particularly in the Southeastern part of the United States and Florida in particular, were actually African. Um, Jacksonville, Florida, which was Fort St. Augustine's, which was a Spanish fort there in Florida before it became the city of Jacksonville. It was staffed by all Africans. It was an all African garrison. And those African soldiers were sent there to one, pacify the Indians, which meant to control the Cherokees and Creek and Southeastern Indians, but they also were sent there to protect uh, the Florida Indians, the Appalachians. There were over 20,000, 30,000 Florida Indians uh, that had become peaceful Indians and who had uh, converted to Catholicism. And they were there to protect those Indians from um, other warlike Indians and from other people. But there is a great deal we know, again, from the Spanish that is rarely talked about in which we see the blending of people, Indians, Africans, and Europeans, and we see our earliest, what you might call triracial uh, isolates or triracial people uh, in that region during that particular time period, okay? And when the English come, and this is all happening in the, in the late 1400s, but early 1500s, between 1540 and 1571, we see this all this change in occurring. So you have people who are, um, Spanish and African, you have people who are native and African, you have people who are Spanish and Indian um, and, and native and uh, African and Indian, and then you have triracial isolates, those people who are a blending or a mixture of all three um, throughout the 1540s. So the Spanish are the ones who really began this mixing and because of the African slave trade and the bringing in of large numbers of Africans, 
into the Caribbean and eventually into the mainland of North America, uh, we're going to see that heavy uh, mixing happening uh, during that particular time period. Now, I'm, I feel pretty confident I'm out of time, but I will show you a few illustrations about Africans uh, being taken during the African slave trade because it is the Portuguese and the Spanish who really start the African slave trade across the Atlantic. Um, Smallwood. Yes. We we. I would love for you to be able to finish. Um, would would five more minutes do it, or ten more minutes do it for you? Yeah, I I'll, I'll can move quickly. At least. Okay. Let I want you to finish. And to um our listeners, thank you so much. Some are, many are saying, please give him more time. We do try to wrap up, you know, just so there's plenty of time for Q and A, but. This is wonderful. And so we're going to ask you just to continue until you're finished. Okay. Yeah. And I'll move more quickly through slides, but I, I just wanted to give foundational information to everyone so that you kind of see the relationship between your region. And I'm assuming many of you are from the Virginia, Carolina region, even if you've moved away from it. And if you're doing genealogy, this impacts what you're doing because this is the backstory on what you're finding when you find mulatto and you find these different Indian groups. So now Absolutely I'm- Absolutely no problem. Let me just say to our participants who are um, <clears throat> live with us on the Zoom, we usually stop and do announcements at three o'clock. The announcements will be on our Facebook page. So if you end up having to leave, uh, don't worry about it. They'll be on our Facebook page and Dr. Smallwood, please continue. Thank you very much. So, so now I'm moving to Africa. You know, we talked about the African slave trade, and this map is really representative of a later period in the trade after the Spanish, you know, and when we have the English and the French and other nations in North America. But, you know, how this process starts is, you know, again, it's going to be the same, whether we're talking about the Portuguese, whether we're talking about the Spanish, or whether we're talking about uh, later the British and the French, um, this process is still the same. It wasn't the Europeans who went into the interior to, to capture slaves. It was other Africans who, you know, attacked the villages of Africans. Uh, the new movie, I cannot think of the name um, uh, of the new movie that just came out with the, uh, the women warriors. Uh, it was a very good movie and very accurate in terms of talking about how villages were being, you know, attacked or people would be kidnapped while they were out farming. And as Europeans gave the Africans guns, uh, these African slavers, you know, would use their guns to attack villages uh, to seize uh, people. Those who resisted, of course, would be shot, as this, this illustration uh, indicates and shows. Um, and uh, then those who, uh, then they would, they would be able to take the children and take the women and uh, take the uh, men if they could. Um, when they seized these people, they would take them on forced marches to the coast to be sold. And in these forced marches, through these raids, you have people who have been wounded. You have people who, you know, are malnourished. And think about now, these raids were as far inland as, let's say, Raleigh, North Carolina. And then they have to be marched down to the coast, let's say, to Wilmington. Or if you're in Virginia, they're as far inland as Petersburg or Suffolk. And then they have to be marched out to the coast to Newport News or to Virginia Beach to be loaded onto ships to be sailed off. Well, many of these uh, slaves, you know, some being wounded, um, not being being malnourished, uh, that's a long march. That's over 100 miles, right? It's 100 mile, 120, 130 mile march to the coast. So many of these people will die on these marches after being, uh, uh, you know, having witnessed their family members being killed in the villages. And I'll have to pause and talk about this. Unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, tragedy in history. There's a lot of uh, barbarity in history. And um, with the African slave trade, this is, you know, another example of that. I ask people all the time, will people do anything for money? Well, yeah, we know that there are people who will do anything for money. There are people who sell drugs to our children for money. Uh, there are people who exploit our young ladies for money. So people will do anything for money. It doesn't matter what color they are, white, black, whatever, people do anything for money. And so, yes, there were Africans involved in the African slave trade. Yes, they actually went into the interior using European weapons and technology, attacking villages and taking the women and children. And then this part of the trade, we talk about the Middle Passage. And we talk about conservatively three to five million people who die in the Middle Passage. 
and conservatively nine to 12 million people were taken across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to uh, the Americas with three to five million of them dying in what we call the Middle Passage. We never talk about the attack on villages in Africa and the people that were killed from the attacks and the scarring that you are living a comfortable life in your home. Somebody kicks in the door, they shoot your father in the head in front of you, they kill your brother and your sister because they're fighting back, and then they take you and they force march you off and sell you into slavery. The psychological damage starts there and the deaths and destruction start there. And how many uh, millions of Africans were killed in these raids on villages and in the forced marches from those villages to the coast where they were going to be sold, no one has done a count. We don't know how many millions were you know, killed and harmed you know, in the raids on the villages and the marches to the coast. So it's important to understand you know, with the African slave trade that we talk about the Middle Passage. We talk about the Africans brought to the castles, the slave castles on the coast, and then loaded onto ships and then the, the madness of being on those ships and then being transported across the Atlantic Ocean. But we don't talk about the millions of families that were torn apart and people were destroyed um, and irreparably damaged mentally by seeing their whole villages and their families and communities destroyed. They take all the young people, all the women, all the children, they leave the old people, but then the old people don't have anyone to provide for them and take care of them. So the toll and the devastation is just immeasurable. We talk about the slave trade, and I know you've heard these stories before, so I won't dwell on them very long, but uh, with the Atlantic slave trade, we have the slaves on board the ships, and you have to understand in terms of the passage, uh, how these slaves are transported. You know, you have men and women all mixed together, children, they're all mixed together on different levels of the ship in the same place and just put on the ship together. People have never been to sea before, so people are, you know, sick. They get seasick. They get... Uh, um, they have uh, diarrhea, you know, some women are on their menstrual cycles. There is no cleanliness. There is no, you know, way of, of taking care of the people. They're just all thrown on the ship and chained together on the ship. You might be beside somebody who's dead and been dead for two days, three days, you know, and you're just chained beside a dead body. All of these people speaking different languages, it's just a concophony of insanity, of noises. You don't understand anyone. You can't communicate with people. And then when you do arrive uh, to your destination in the Americas, you are so emaciated, you know, so psychologically damaged that, you know, those who didn't die in the Middle Passage, who didn't die um, when they were taken from their homes, uh, will die shortly after arriving in the Americas because they are too injured, too malnourished, and psychologically many of them are have just lost their mind and uh, are really unable to, to function. And these people, nobody wants these slaves. They don't want someone who's already injured or already you know, dying. They don't want someone who is obviously psychologically damaged and cannot you know, function or follow commands. And so those slaves are left to die on the beaches uh, where they land in the Caribbean and in the Americas, okay? And then those who resist you know, their punishments for them to basically you know, force them into um, compliance uh, during you know, these particular periods. So this is the acceleration of the slave trade. It doesn't matter if it's Portuguese, it doesn't matter if it's Spanish, doesn't matter if it's English or if it's French or if it's the Dutch, you know, that is the origins of the slave trade. And that's what we're dealing with and what we're talking about when we're talking about the slave trade. So when we talk about the first Africans in North Carolina, it is important to note that they come to North Carolina prior to the Africans coming to Virginia in 1619. And we've already talked about these regions. I've already talked to you about, you know, um, the Chawan River, the Roanoke River. Um, if you go out, you see the word Albemarle Sound, then you see Roanoke Island, which is right there, um, right there before you get to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So many people are familiar with the English arriving in North Carolina in 1584, exploring the coastal areas of North Carolina and mapping what we call the Outer Banks and mapping what becomes known as Roanoke Island and the various Indian nations and Indian peoples in Northeast North Carolina, Southeast North Carolina, and along the Roanoke and the Chawan Rivers. Um, 
I always point out to people, Indian Woods, as Marvin just mentioned, if you look at this map of uh, Eastern North Carolina, and I hope you all can clearly see that this is Eastern North Carolina, but if you look closely at the map, you will see up at the top here, I don't know if y'all can follow my cursor or not, but you'll see Virginia, B-I-R-G-I-N-I-A. Eastern North Carolina was always Virginia, remained Virginia until Virginia was established, and then it was called Old Virginia. And you can clearly see the Albemarle Sound, the Chowan River with the Meharan and Nottoway Rivers going off, and the Roanoke River. And you'll clearly see here this little town called Moratuck. And Moratuck is Indian Woods. That's my home. And at Moratuck, um, when the English came up the Roanoke River to Moratuck, uh, my Tuscarora ancestors attacked the English and drove them back out to Roanoke Island. And then according to tradition, they pursued them to the island because they say they were the ones who took the white women and children from Roanoke Island and uh, basically intermixed with them and blended with them. And that's a whole nother narrative, a whole nother story, what happened to the lost colony. But you can clearly see the villages of these people, which again are Iroquois longhouses. You saw them with the five nations in New York State. You saw them with the Spanish when they came through and burned and destroyed things. And you see them again, you know, mapped and drawn by the English, uh, John White and Ralph Lane. We see the layout of the villages, the very highly advanced, you know, communities with gardens of, you know, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. You see the corn in the distance, you see the squash, and you see the beans, and then you also see the tobacco. You see uh, them conducting religious ceremonies, you see people hunting, you see children playing. So you see a, a very you know, well-established community of people um, who are in an abundant landscape, you know, fishing, you know, hunting, thriving, and living well uh, in Eastern North Carolina. It's important to understand that when the English came, they brought disease. Hi, Dr. Every Smallwood, if I, yeah. if I may. <laughs> It is very clear that the, the community is loving your presentation. And so we have a proposal. Perhaps we can invite you back to do a part two and continue learning from you uh, as you share this very valuable and informative information. Do you think we could maybe plan on doing that? Let's do that. That'll be fine. Okay. Okay. And maybe just another couple minutes to wrap up today, and then we can take some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Okay, I will we'll do that. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about this disease and stop there. So uh, two minutes, hopefully. Okay. Uh, just two minutes and then we'll take questions. But all of this is well il illustrated. You know, when the English came, we talked about the Spanish. Now we're talking about the English. It's well illustrated, you know, what the, what the uh, communities were like, what the people were like, and well documented that throughout eastern North Carolina, from the Chowan and Roanoke Rivers down to the Tar and Noose, that everywhere the English went, they spread disease, and that disease had a negative impact on those communities. Now, the, the last piece I want to share before we jump to questions is I want to share the introduction of the Africans on Roanoke Island and the impact that they had on the coastal peoples in North Carolina. Uh, and I think I'll stop with this map and, and tell this quick story, and then we can talk. If you look at those early drawings by John White and Ralph Lane, and you look at the Indian groups that they document and the villages that they document in eastern North Carolina, um, in northeast North Carolina, as well as, you know, throughout coastal North Carolina. One thing that you will notice is that you do not see any Machapunga Indians. You don't see Bear River Indians and you don't see Madame Mesquite Indians. Now, I'll go back to the map just so that you can have a quick glance at it, and then we'll come back to that, right? Native nations are laid out, right? And they map the villages, and they map communities, and they name the different Indians. Even the Monagoks, who are the Tuscaroras to the west, but they name all the Indians. But nowhere on these early maps do we see um, Indians uh, who are called Machapungas, Bear River, or Madame Mesquite. And the reason why I'm focusing on these three is because my presentation started by talking about triracials, 
And it started by talking about, you know, the triracial history of North Carolina. And I mentioned that that triracial history begins um, before 1619. Well, in 1586, Sir Francis Drake brings over 600 Africans, Moors, uh, West Indian uh, Indians to Eastern North Carolina, and he releases them on Roanoke Island in 1586, a year before the whites disappear. And he released them into the landscape and no one's ever cared what happened to those people. But if you go to places like Hyde County in Eastern North Carolina, you'll find people who say they always had been there, African-Americans who have blue eyes and green eyes, who clearly look like they're of mixed heritage, you know, native African heritage, and they'll say that they always been there. And we know that the Machapunga Indians and the Bear River Indians and the Matamuskeet Indians, they're what we call Black Indians. And they didn't exist in the landscape prior to this release. But by the time of the Tuscarora War, they are in alliance with the Tuscaroras, and they are clearly uh, mixed Indians, uh, Indians who are of mixed race. And so we see, again, a very uh, transforming impact of the English on North America, because the English do actually introduce these Africans into the region, and these Africans end up intermixing with the uh, native people and living in the swampy areas of eastern North Carolina and southeast North Carolina and Virginia, um, northeast North Carolina and Virginia, the Great Dismal Swamp, the Alligator Swamp, and throughout that region and intermix with one another. So I'm going to stop here. And uh, again, thank you all for being as patient as you have been, because I, I mean, again, I do go on, uh, but there's so much history that's unknown that I have to touch. I try to touch on. I can't just jump straight in. I got to give background. So I apologize to everyone for giving too much background, but I'm ready for questions. Dr. Smallwood, there's no such thing as too much background, and you have absolutely nothing to apologize for. Uh, your presentation exactly. has been fantastic, just as we knew it would be, and it actually breaks our hearts to have to cut you <laughs> off like this. So we definitely will arrange with you uh, for part two, as long as you're willing. Um, I'm going to end the live feed to YouTube right now, but I have put in the YouTube chat the link if you want to join us in the Zoom, so you can do that. And so let me just end that right quick. Dr. Smallwood, take a break, get yourself some water, do whatever you need to do. Um, and Tania, if you want to go ahead and uh, share announcements while I'm stopping the live stream. Uh, yeah. Dr.